Uh, thank you, Sister Winfrieda, for that powerful message and song. Uh, indeed, Jesus will carry us through. Uh, it's our joy this afternoon to meet with you and to study God's word together under the topic of the new covenant, uh, the new covenant and its applications for the true modern day Christians and Seventh-day Adventist Christians. As we begin our Bible study, I invite us to pray and invite the Holy Spirit so that he will be the one to teach us and to instruct us as we go through the Bible together. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Our God and our Father, uh, it's our joy and our privilege to come before your throne at this time and to just ask that you will send him the Holy Spirit, the one you said would remind us, the one you said would come and teach us all things so that we would be comforted, so that we'll be strengthened even as we go through difficult times in this perilous world. This is our prayer and our petition in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Beloved, once again, I want to uh, welcome you and uh, thank you for taking your time this afternoon uh, to study with us on this very important topic of the new covenant and its applications for every modern day Christian and Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, some of us have encountered uh, people who will say, um, are Seventh-day Adventists new covenant Christians? Some of us have encountered people who will uh, bring out certain aspects of the new covenant uh, in a light that we have never heard it before. So today we're going to go through uh, a four uh, different aspects of the new covenant uh, so that we gain a good understanding of what uh, the Bible and God actually says on this uh, important topic. Um, as we begin our study and uh, the, the, the theme uh, text is in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, and we're reading uh, verse uh, 6 to verse 13. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to verse 13. Uh, here, my Bible reads, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also mediator of a much better covenant, which was established on better promises. Verse seven, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will, put my, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 11, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none, in, none his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Verse 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Verse 13, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now this is the text or the uh, passage in the Bible that we'll be seeking to understand throughout all the various presentations 
uh, that we will go through uh, today. Like I highlighted, uh, we are seeking to have a better understanding of the new covenant. And therefore we needed to, to study certain other aspects so that we have a broader and clear understanding. So some of the uh, aspects that we will deal with are one, uh, whether there are any differences between the everlasting covenant, uh, the first covenant and the second. The second thing that we will deal with, um, we will change the order. Um, and the next thing that we will deal with is the covenant commencement. When did the new covenant begin? When did the old covenant begin? When did the old covenant end? What about the everlasting covenant? When did that begin? So that will be the second aspect that we'll deal with. And then um, the last uh, aspects that we'll deal with are the covenant law and the covenant signs. And under these two aspects, we'll deal with the issues of uh, the law of the Ten Commandments. And finally, the covenant sign will also deal with the issues of the Sabbath. So we will now get into our study just now. And I choose to, to start um, the presentation on um, the old covenant, new covenant, and everlasting covenant by showing the context and showing the importance of this issue. And in this regard, I therefore had asked uh, a question. And I'm saying, one of the most important questions that you and me will need to encounter in our lives is the question of, is my name written there? Is my name written there? Is my name written in the book of life? And I'm taking this from the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8. Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8. Revelation 13, verse 8 says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Again, all that dwell upon the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. From verse one and verse two, you understand that this first hymn who will be worshipped is actually Satan. So the Bible identifies that in the end, there will only be two groups. There will only be two groups and two sides, according to Revelation 13 verse 8. On one group, there will be the people who are deceived and worshipping the devil. And on the other side, there will be those whose names are written in the book of the Lamb. Now, this becomes a very important uh, issue then. Because then how does then the covenant come into this question? And when we come to the book of Psalm, Psalm chapter 50, verse 1 to 5. Uh, Psalm is in the Old uh, Testament, the book of Psalms. And uh, Psalm 50, verse 1 to 5, the Bible says, the mighty one, God the Lord has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to the going down. Out of Zion and perfection of beauty, God will shine. Verse 3, our God shall come and he shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Verse 5 brings in the issue of the covenant. He says, gather my saints together to me. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So Psalm 50 verse 5 is identifying that the people that God considers as his are those who have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. And this is what brings in the issue of understanding what 
a covenant is. So the question, what is a covenant, is answered uh, simply um, in this way. A covenant is an agreement uh, between two parties, and it is premised on grace. Uh, the, because the parties may not be at the same level, they may not be peers, okay? So it is premised on grace because the, the more superior being will need to extend or show grace to the inferior or the lower being. So in this case, we're saying a covenant is this relationship, this uh, agreement that is there between God and us, the human beings. God is not at the same level with us. And that is why uh, he, he premises his relationship with us on grace, okay? And then I added one more aspect, and that is that the biblical covenants are sealed with blood. If you read all of them, you will notice that there was always an aspect where they would need to uh, shed blood, and the blood would then uh, signify or, or represent that the covenant is now being effected. So a covenant is an agreement, a relationship that has been sealed with blood, just like Psalm 50 verse 5 had identified, that gather to me, my people, uh, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. It's not our sacrifice that God is interested in. It is his sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the Bible um, explains that there have been various uh, uh, covenants, and these covenants have had uh, um, existence at different times, uh, but I will highlight them basically just as three. So the everlasting covenant, um, which is popularly known as uh, the covenant of grace. This is the covenant that was entered in by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before the creation of the world. Just like Revelation uh, 13 verse 8 brought out that Jesus is the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. This is also uh, sometimes called the Council of Peace, as in uh, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13, that God establishes a count, his Council of Peace is what brings us uh, this grace. Okay. And uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, speaking about this everlasting covenant, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, um, helps us to understand 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. It says, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to to his own purpose and grace, which he has given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So it is identifying that there is this um, relationship that God established with us even before uh, the existence of this world or before time began. And this is known as the everlasting covenant. It's God who established it between themselves as the Godhead, that they would extend their goodness to us. And then the next uh, covenant um, is what is referred to as the new covenant, the, the first covenant, and then the new covenant, which we had read in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to verse 13. I'll just highlight verse um, verse seven, and then I will also highlight verse eight. Here the Bible says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, there would no place have been sought uh, for a second. 
because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, God spoke these words to humanity or to um, Paul is, is quoting um, this particular passage we have in Hebrews chapter 8 from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verse 31 to 34. So you will notice that the exact same words that you find in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34, is what Paul quotes in Hebrews. Meaning the promise of the new covenant was given to them at the time of Jeremiah. Okay, so before, um, before um, the time of Jeremiah, there was a covenant in place. So the question um, that you will be asking is, when do these covenants begin? Will be addressed very soon uh, by my colleague, uh, Elder uh, Ngambi, and he will show us when these covenants uh, each begin. But for now, I will just try and show you some of the differences that are there between the old covenant and the new covenant, or to use the terms uh, that the Bible uses itself, between the first covenant and the second covenant. In verse uh, 31, of Jeremiah chapter 31, or if you want, you can read it in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. It's quoting the same things. The, the Bible says, uh, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. God is saying uh, the covenant that he's going to establish is still with Israel and with Judah. So both the old covenant and the new covenant have this, um, this common thing that they are covenants with the house of Judah. So it's not God establishing a covenant with a different set of people. He is establishing it still with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And you may be wondering in your mind and saying, but I thought the new covenant is for us. Well, even the first covenant was for us and their verses in the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, uh, verse uh, 7 and 8, Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7 and 8, shows that it was always God's intention that his covenant with Israel would include every other race and people. So I'll read um, uh, Isaiah 56, uh, verse 6 and seven and eight. The Bible says in Isaiah 56, verse six, seven and eight, it says also the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted at my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So when God established his covenant with Israel, this covenant was embracing all nations, according to verse uh, 7 of Isaiah 56. And the other verse I will cite for us is uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 and verse 5. Here God is speaking to the children of Israel when he meets them at Mount Sinai. And this is what the Bible says. It says, I'll start from verse 4. It says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandments, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people of 
above all people, for all the earth is mine. And if you shall be to me, verse 6 again, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So God's intention was for Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, a priest doesn't exist for himself. A priest exists to uh, serve others, to be an intercessor between God and another person. So if the whole nation was going to be a kingdom of priests, then they were being established so that they could serve others, just like Isaiah 56 also brought out. So basically, what we have established so far is that uh, God's covenant, the first one, and even the new one, will still be with Israel and Judah so that they can be of service to the whole world. Back to Jeremiah uh, 31, verse 32. Jeremiah 31, verse 32. The Bible here says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, uh, the day I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, even though I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant I will make with the house with I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So God is saying. The reason why he is establishing a new covenant is because they broke the first one. Jeremiah 31, verse 32. And then verse 33, God is saying, in the new covenant, he will write his laws in our hearts and in our minds, and he will be our God, and we will be his people. When God meets them at Mount Sinai, God writes the Ten Commandments, uh, Exodus chapter 20. Oh, the, the one which is more explicit in this regard is Exodus chapter 31, uh, verse 16 to 18, where it says that God wrote uh, these uh, Ten Commandments on stones, on two tablets of stones. But in in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, which Paul cites in Hebrews chapter 8, God is saying he will write the law in our hearts and in our minds. So God is not saying um, throwing away something. He's saying the law will be now written in our hearts and in our minds. That is the new aspect of the the new covenant. Um, verse 34 brings out the last aspect, which seems to be distinguished. It says, no more will any man say to his brother, uh, know the Lord, for everyone will be known by God. And everyone will know God. So how is this writing of the law in our hearts and minds achieved? It is through the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who comes to teach us and to remind us of these things. John chapter 14, verse 26. He is our teacher. John chapter 14, verse 17. So God is saying, in the new covenant, I will write. The Holy Spirit is the one who will write these things in your minds. When something is written in your mind, you know it. Uh, for a fact, you, you know it, uh, you can recite it without anyone asking you about it. Um, for instance, no one will need to ask you uh, to refer to a book to um, establish how or whether you love your wife. If it is possible, you will begin to recite how much you love your wife from your very heart. And this is what God is saying. He's saying, you'll be able to know me. You'll be able to do uh, my laws from your heart. 
It will not be something that uh, is written somewhere else on a tablet of stone that you will need to go and refer to from somewhere else, but it will be something that you know from your heart and therefore you'll be able to, to uh, do it on your own. So what are the distinctions? Um, in the old or the first, God was giving them uh, the types and the, the symbols, okay? Because when God comes to establish the first covenant, which uh, my uh, brother will be coming in to, to show us, um, the real is not yet there. So he begins to give them things that help them to see what God is going to do. And God had given them things like the lambs. So when Adam and Eve sin in the garden, God brings the lamb. And uh, Adam puts his hands on the lamb and confesses his sins. And Adam is asked to slay the lamb. And when Adam slays the lamb and its blood is used uh, to transfer his sins um, uh, to, um, away from him, uh, which Paul then uh, later on in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, without the shedding of, of blood, there is no remission of sins. And we see that the coat uh, of each lamb that was uh, slain is then used to make tunics for, for Adam and Eve, who had initially chosen to wear um, leaves, the fig leaves. So we find that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, that God makes clothes for them. Um, and these clothes are from um, the covering of the lamb that was slain in their behalf. So we see that initially they just had things that pointed to the original. So in the first covenant, there are things that are pointing to the original. In the new covenant, God brings the real things and he enables us to be able to see what he is doing. At this time, beloved, we will take uh, a break. I, um, I will request for a special song. When we come back, uh, Elder Davilius Ngambi will take us through when the new covenant commences and when the old covenant commenced. Oh, 
Uh, good afternoon, church, Central Church. Uh, thanks a lot, Elder Chikula, for reading us so well. I think uh, the introduction is quite uh, elaborate, and uh, we are learning about the new covenant. And uh, for this afternoon, my task is uh, simple. I think it's just as Elder Chikula has alluded to, uh, just to show you when did the old covenant begin and end, and when is the new covenant uh, starting. So allow me to share my screen. Uh, Okay, I'm, I'm sure we, we, we can see it there. Uh, <clears throat> maybe just as a way of starting, um, as an introduction, uh, when we read Genesis 2, 16 and 17, we got there tells us and the Lord commanded that, uh, okay, so I think I need to, we need to manage this one, yes. So the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Uh, in this one, we see God making a covenant and uh, in his great grace, God gave permission uh, before he gave restriction. And the permission was brought. Uh, he says of every tree. Well, the restriction was quite narrow as we read in verse 17. Uh, man could almost do anything he wanted. This could be deemed as the first covenant between God and man. So we see man in Genesis 3, uh, verse 6, failing to keep this uh, covenant. And um, Elder Chikula has talked uh, about uh, this one. Man falls and uh, God has to kill a lamb so that uh, man can be covered. And uh, in Hebrews, we are told that uh, there is no forgiveness of sin without 
the remission of blood. And so after this one, uh, we see now there's a covenant with Noah um, in Genesis 6, verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, you and your wife and your son's wives with you. So here, this is where we meet the word uh, covenant for the first time uh, in the Bible. And God said he would make a covenant with Noah. So the word itself implies intention to honor uh, what one says will do. So the word comes loaded with commitment. And so this was a covenant with Noah. Uh, as we have started, we see that covenant actually with Adam, which also uh, affects. And uh, as we go on, talking about upgrades. Uh, so there are some covenants that may be just as a way of getting us to somewhere that we need to look at. Uh, Genesis 17, uh, 7 introduces us to the Abrahamic covenant. Of course, this one starts in Genesis 12, uh, but uh, it is sealed here. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting uh, covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. So here we see God establishing a covenant with Abraham and uh, his posterity that emphasized in more detail the divine plan to save uh, humankind from the results of sin. The Lord has not was not the Lord was not going to leave his world unattended, not with it in such dire need. So in his grace, God chose, God had chosen Abraham as his instrument to assist in proclaiming the plan of salvation to the world. So God, God's fulfillment of his covenant promises was, however, linked to Abraham's willingness to do righteously and to obey him, uh, obey him by faith. So without that obedience on Abraham's part, God could not use uh, him. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to just go into a little bit more what, so that uh, we just really see what, uh, where and how we will start, this covenant started. Uh, then we will talk about the Sinai covenant. In Exodus 19, three to six, and Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, thus, uh, my, there's something obstructing my, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I abhor why what and how I abhor you. I bore you on uh, eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you uh, will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure. Uh, you shall be a special treasure uh, to me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation these are the words which uh, you shall speak to the children of israel and uh, so this is the fourth command the, the covenant listed in the bible and uh, in it god reveals himself more fully than before particularly as the entire sanctuary is uh, established so we've uh, seen the covenant in uh, Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. And here we have more or less like upgrades. We have that covenant uh, that was just uh, given to Noah and uh, his family. And then we have the Abrahamic covenant, as we shall see later in more detail, that uh, that covenant in many ways uh, actually affects all of us and um, 
all those that are called by uh, Christ's uh, name. So, of course, after the Sinai covenant, there are also other covenants that were uh, made by God with man, but we'll not go into those. And I'm sure we've seen from here when the first covenant or the old covenant was uh, given to man. And then we go to the new covenant. When we read in Hebrews 12, verse 24, uh, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. So the new covenant kicks in when Jesus says it is finished as he hangs on the cruel cross of Calvary. So we can also read uh, Luke 22, verse 20. Luke 22, verse 20, and uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. Um, Luke, uh, Luke 22, verse 20 reads, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So at the cross of Calvary, we see the new covenant uh, kicking in. Dr. Chinyanta talked about uh, lambs and all being killed for the remission of man's sins. And so now we are entering into a better covenant as Hebrews 8, uh, verse 6, as this is our main text for this afternoon's uh, study, as was read by Elder Chinyanta. Hebrews 8, uh, verse 6 actually says, this is a better uh, covenant in that we do not uh, need anymore to kill all those lambs and all and bulls for all of us. So the basis of the new covenant, the basic hope that it has for us, its basic conditions are the same as what was found in the old covenant. So we talk about the killing of lambs in the old covenant. And uh, we are told that there's no forgiveness of sin without uh, the remission of blood. And so it has always been a covenant of God's grace and mercy, a covenant based on a love that transcends human weaknesses and defeats. So John 10.10 10 actually tells us that I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And so it is up to all of us actually to accept uh, this sacrifice that was made once and for all on our behalf and uh, we will have life. So Hebrews 13, 20 to 21, now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. So here we see that the new covenant is actually also the everlasting covenant through the blood of Jesus. In Galatians 3, uh, 16 and 29, we also note the connection of the Abrahamic covenant to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So Galatians 3, 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And 29, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so we've also talked about uh, basic conditions that were in the uh, first covenant. that it was actually pointing to the new covenant. So the whole idea was for God uh, to bring back mankind to himself. God did not want us to perish. And so when man sinned initially, uh, as we looked at uh, in the introduction, that actually God gave us a lot of uh, uh, trees to eat from. But only one uh, was there a restriction. 
And we find that uh, man fails in that. But God had a plan of salvation just from the foundation of the earth. And so immediately he kills a lamb so that uh, Adam and Eve could live. And uh, from there, we see Jesus Christ coming to die for mankind. And uh, basically, this is what we uh, We, we, we can show to say where and when these covenants uh, were starting. I think for now I can hand back to Elder Chikula. I'm sure we'll come back maybe later for one or two issues if there will be any need for clarifications. Elder Chikula. Amen. Now, beloved, we're going to have an interactive uh, session. Um, around the, the new covenants and the, the old covenants. At this time, uh, however, we're going to have a song and then we'll come back for just uh, a brief session of 10 minutes um, of the last aspect, which is dealing with the covenant signs and the covenant law. And then we'll open up for a dialogue for you and us to just interact and see whether there are any issues uh, that come out of uh, the presentations. At this time, I invite the special song. Yeah. 
Praise God for that uh, beautiful song, uh, Brother Sidon and uh, the, the group. Um, right now, we're now going to focus on the question of the covenant law and the covenant signs. Now, the Bible in the book of Psalm 138 verse 2 has this to say. It says, I will worship towards your holy temple and I will praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. At the end of that verse, the Bible is saying, God has magnified his word. What God says is more important than his name, his reputation, his authority. So God has put a high value on what he says. In the covenant, God is so faithful to the covenant to the extent that he will always keep or come to, to establish what he has said. And we see him in the covenant with Abraham uh, because he promised Abraham that he would give him a son. God comes through for Abraham even at the age of 100. In the Noah uh, covenant, um, um, Genesis chapter 9, God says, um, even though the world has sinned, and even though they had done all this evil, and I have destroyed everyone, I am giving you my word that I will never destroy the earth again with a flood. And he gives them a sign the sign of the rainbow. Now, to this day, the rainbow continues to fly all over the earth. And we know that God has not destroyed the entire earth again with a flood since the time of Noah. What are we saying? God is faithful to what he says. God is faithful to what he says. And therefore, when God says something, uh, this thing that God says stands forever. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, puts it in this way. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the Bible says, um, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The flower fadeth, the grass fadeth, but the word of our God stands forever. Whatever God says, it will stand the test of time. This is why even when Jesus comes to establish the new covenant in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But who, whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So God, again, and tying to the first question that I brought out to us about having our names written in the book of life, Jesus is saying no one will enter heaven who does not 
live by what they say. And what is he talking about? He's saying those who teach God's law, those who teach God's word, if they don't live by what they are teaching, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And God is, um, is, is being very clear here. This is Jesus speaking. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he is bringing out this aspect that he did not come to do away with the law, with the Ten Commandments, or with anything that was written by God, because God's word stands forever. Jesus has come to fulfill it, to establish it. What are we saying, beloved? Why are we raising this issue? It is because uh, there are certain uh, people who in this day and age have started to teach that the new covenant means that God's 10 commandments or his law has been done away with. But when we read Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to verse 13, where Paul is discussing the new covenant, Paul is actually also quoting Jeremiah, who is saying, God is not coming to do away with the law in the new covenant. Rather, he is coming to write this law in our hearts. There are difficult texts uh, that people usually cite to say, no, um, God has done away with the law. Okay, And so I will pick on two of them and uh, try and explain them and show that uh, God has not done away with the law in the new covenant, but rather God comes to fulfill the law. Uh, the first one I will pick on um, that some people have cited to say, here is the verse which says, uh, because of the new covenant, God has done away with the law, is uh, Hebrews chapter 7, uh, verse 11 and 12. So I'm reading in your hearing. It says, therefore, if perfection we are through Levitical, the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priesthood should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not called according to the order of Aaron? Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed for the, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things were spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. So some people will just pick, cherry pick this verse, uh, Hebrews chapter seven, verse 12, and say, here it is. Here is the verse which is saying, in the new covenant, the law has been changed. But what is this verse talking about? This verse is talking about the fact that in the new covenant, like I had highlighted uh, when we started, the, the first covenant was of types and of symbols. It was just trying to show us uh, what God was going to do. So you had the lamb you had a priest and the, the lamb needed to be slaughtered and the priest needed to then uh, intercede on, on your behalf, okay? So in the old covenant or in the first covenant, the people who were then chosen to be priests, um, after Moses received these commandments and the children of Israel were established as a nation, the first tribe that took over the priesthood was the tribe, the Levites, and specifically Aaron's family. So Aaron's family comes in to, uh, to be the priests. And this is what this uh, verse is talking about. It's saying um, when Moses does the types and symbols, the ones who are the priests, it's Aaron's tribe, the Levites, but Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. So there is a change in the law. I hope you, you get the sense. There's a change in the law itself. 
but it doesn't mean that the law of God or the Ten Commandments have been changed because these issues of who would be priests were part of the ceremonial laws, okay? The priest was there to conduct the ceremonies, okay? And God had chosen Aaron as part of the, to be the priests with his family for a special reason, okay? And this is what changed. So you will then ask, but um, how does then Jesus come in as a priest? And the book of Psalm uh, 110 um, gives us um, the verse which quotes about uh, Jesus becoming a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110 verse 4. The Bible says, the Lord has shown you and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, we can see that this is a fulfillment of Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where Jesus says, I've not come to do away or to destroy what is in the law. I've come to fulfill. So Jesus comes to fulfill this verse of Psalm 110, verse 4. Now, who was Melchizedek? Melchizedek is the high priest who meets Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham is the great grandfather of Levi, who from whose line then Aaron and these others are born. Okay. So what are we saying? We're saying Melchizedek was there first as a high priest before Aaron. So when Jesus comes in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus is taking us back to the order, to the, to the first order, and not he's, he's not just changing it for his own sake. But why is Melchizedek cited? Uh, Melchizedek is cited because he is a king and a priest. So Jesus comes to be a king and a priest. And it is in this sense that Hebrews chapter 7 verse 12 now makes sense that for the priesthood being changed uh, of necessity, there is also a change of the law or a change in the law. Okay. Meaning now the ceremonial laws were being done away with. The ceremonial laws are the ones which uh, said only the tribe of, of, uh, of Aaron and Levi could be priests. So this answers uh, this uh, particular verse. Another verse and, or another chapter which is cited to say, no, uh, the Ten Commandments have been done away with and uh, this is based on the new covenant is Second uh, Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 7 to verse, um, I can, you can read all the way up to verse 18, but I think it just uh, speaks about it up to verse, um, verse 15. Now, in Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to verse uh, 15, uh, the Bible is talking about the new covenant, and Paul um, is using illustrations to help us understand that when God comes on Mount Sinai, he writes his law on tablets of stone, okay? God writes his law on tablets of stone, and the person who receives these tablets of stone is Moses, but when Moses is receiving these tablets of stone, there is this glory around his face because he has been in the presence of God. And um, the people could not behold him. And so he had to put a veil on, on himself, okay? So that they could uh, stand in his presence because he was glowing, he was shining. So God is 
is, is not saying that he is changing the law. When you read this uh, chapter in context, God is saying, I am changing now in the sense that I'm not writing the law on tablets of stone, which was then kept in the ark, hidden away. I am writing the law in your hearts. And what is the means that I will use to write the law? It is by the spirit of God. And basically, this is the, the issue that Paul is addressing, how the spirit of God writes God's law in our hearts. Okay, It is not saying that the law is done away with. It is saying um, what is written with pens and, and ink, if we want to follow it to the latter, we may become um, legalistic. But what God writes on our hearts makes us renewed people and it makes us a changed people. And we are changed into the same likeness that Jesus has. The last uh, difficult uh, verse that I will address for now so that I give us time to discuss is Colossians chapter two. Colossians chapter two is dealing with the covenant sign. Now you and I know that in Genesis chapter two, verse one to three, uh, before sin, God has just finished creating the world in six days. And everything is complete. He says everything is very good. Then on the seventh day, God has ended his work. He rests and he commands a blessing upon this day. It's called the, the, the Sabbath. God commands a blessing. He says it is blessed and he makes it holy. So this becomes a sign to humanity that God is the one who has made the earth. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, God again re repeats this understanding. He says, for in six days, God created the heavens and the earth. Therefore, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He repeats it in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 5 when he says, um, remember uh, to keep the Sabbath day holy. Why? Because you were slaves and I delivered you out of uh, the land of bondage. In Exodus chapter 31, verse, um, verse um, 18, he says, this is a perpetual or an everlasting uh, covenant or sign. I will read uh, that one just, just for us to, to be within the context. Exodus 31, verse 16 uh, to 18. It says, therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end to speaking with, the, with them on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So we see that God basically then establishes the Sabbath as a sign of this covenant between us and him. And he repeats this understanding in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, and Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20. He says, the Sabbath is a sign of our sanctification. The Sabbath is a sign that God is our God. We see Jesus when he comes, he also continues to keep the Sabbath as his personal, um, as his personal custom. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 18 is oftentimes mis interpreted uh, by modern day Christians. And I will read it so that we get the context. Colossians chapter two, verse uh, 16 
and 17 um, is oftentimes misinterpret misinterpreted. Uh, it says, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding to a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So most people will read this verse and say, no, no, no. According to this verse, Paul is saying the Sabbath has been done away with. It is no longer the sign of the everlasting covenant between us and God. So the question then is, is that a correct position? And a proper reading of this chapter will help us understand that, again, Paul is talking about the ceremonial law. And you can establish that when you read uh, verse 14 and 15 of Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. It, verse, uh, chapter, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Sorry about that. It says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, which was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in this. Okay, so we can see that Paul is talking about the handwriting of requirements which was against us. Okay, now which handwriting of requirements was against us? Was it God's Ten Commandments, which were against us? No, it was these ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws are the ones which had uh, divisions between the children of Israel and other people. And they used to prescribe a lot of ceremonies and all these other things. But then you will say, but then how does the Sabbath come in? Um, in this particular context, Paul is referring to Numbers chapter 28 and 29, where God explains these ceremonial laws, such as the, the, the sacrifices and the offerings which were being um, made on these particular days. So God uh, is talking about Sabbath days. He's not talking about uh, the seventh day Sabbaths. Because each one of these days, such as the, um, the Day of Atonement, was considered a Sabbath, okay? It was a day of rest. The, the same way we have holidays, public holiday, okay? Uh, so these were holidays, but they were not holy days. Because the only holy day that God established was the seventh day Sabbath, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. To three. So Paul is referring to the doing away of the necessity of us taking lambs to be slaughtered on holy days, on holy days, okay, such as the Day of Atonement. So Paul is saying Jesus has done away with this requirement for us to bring foods. They will take food offerings. They will take uh, drink offerings and pour them on the altar. They'll take food and burn it on the altar. They'll take lambs and sacrifice them on the altar. Those who didn't have money uh, had the need um, to, to um, uh, find ways and means. It was quite expensive for them to, um, uh, to afford to pay. And therefore it was contrary to them. So Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 17 is saying these sacrifices were a shadow of what Christ would do when he died for us on the cross. And they are not uh, like the covenant sign or the Ten Commandments. At this time, um, I will end this uh, part of the discussion and uh, invite us to give any questions and any comments um, on any aspect of uh, what we have presented that has um, maybe impressed you or something that 
you would like to ask, feel free to uh, unmute your, your mic and then you can interact with us. Elder Ngambi is also at hand uh, to, uh, to respond to any question. Sure, Elda. I hope the people will be quite uh, fast because we only have uh, less than seven minutes to close because we have another meeting at 15.30 for the youths. If the silence continues, yes, is, is that a hand? I think you can just do your concluding remarks. I think you, you have been quite clear this afternoon. I think uh, the people are, are okay. So that right. uh, five, five minutes that are remaining, we can just wind up and then so that we don't uh, enter into the other meeting. All right. Thank you very much, El Dangambi. And uh, thank you very much, beloved, for, for being uh, with us uh, in this um, uh, study that we had today. So I will just give uh, one last uh, confirmation of what we, are, what we have uh, said so far. The, the starting point is that God had a plan, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of saving us uh, from eternity, and that is established by Revelation 13, verse 8. And therefore, when we believe in Jesus, when we enter into a relationship with him, he writes our names in his book, okay? And this is called the Lamb's Book of Life, and we become his children. He writes his law in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and we can see that all the people throughout the generations who, who had a relationship with Jesus always followed what God said. So um, salvation is not just about saying, I believe in Jesus. It's about letting Jesus be the Lord of your life. Or as John 10 verse 16 puts it, uh, my sheep hear my voice, okay? So it's about hearing God's voice. And God's voice, he says it is uh, something that is established, something that cannot be changed. In fact, he regards it even as more important than his name. There are a lot of us who like to say, no, I'll just pray over this pork in the name of Jesus, okay? And then it will be sanctified. The Bible says God honors his word above his name, okay? Therefore, we need to know what does God say? Because even in that uh, particular chapter in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 4, uh, Paul says, it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. So we need two important aspects in our lives. Um, that is to accept the covenant, okay? And then to live uh, by what God is saying to us. In the book of Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter four, uh, Paul brings out a very important aspect. I'll just pick on three verses in this chapter, but you can read it uh, for, for your own enrichment about the covenant law and the covenant sign. Um, verse four says, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Verse seven, the Bible says, again, he designates a certain day saying in David, today after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. A lot of people will read this verse and say, no, God has changed uh, the day we need to keep to today. Uh, but in context, David 
is being cited because God is talking uh, to them about something that he has already said. Um, so Paul is quoting Psalms 92, okay? In Psalms 92, that's where God is saying today. But what is the context of Psalm 92 to Psalm 95, where these quotations are coming from? These are Psalms about the Sabbath day, okay? So beyond the time when they entered the promised land with Joshua, they did not enter into rest. So God comes back in the time of David saying, look, you still are not obeying my voice. Okay, you're not keeping my Sabbath. You're not obeying what I say. Today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. And yet, um, when we come to verse 9, Hebrews chapter 4, Paul says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Um, he's talking to the New Testament Christians. He's saying there is need for us to still keep God's law and God's sign of the Sabbath. Verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 4 says, for he who has entered into his rest has also ceased from his works as God did from his. Paul is simply saying, there is a close connection between our covenant relationship with God and our obeying his voice in keeping his 10 commandments and his law. I hope that this uh, study that we've had today has been of benefit to you. And I hope that each one of you has been blessed. At this time, I hand over again uh, to Brother Roger to give us a special song that will see us out of this meeting after the prayer. Shall we pray together? Our God and our Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that there are a lot of things that could have been said, but we hope that the little that has uh, been shared today has ministered to a soul out there and has cleared out any questions or doubts that we had concerning the new covenant and our relationship as modern day Christians to you. This is our prayer and our thanks in Jesus name. Amen. Brother Roger, a special song. Amen. Amen.
just an announcement to make for those that are still here. Uh, the next program is on the advertised uh, meeting ID. It's a different advertised meeting ID. Already we've seen people are trying to log on to that one. So those of us who are on this one may leave and log on to the one which was advertised for the senior youth's discussion. Thank you very much. God bless you. Amen. God bless. Amen.